Hi everyone, thanks for, for joining us this evening. Um, I know we have uh, everyone up on the uh, live stream. Um, I'm your host this evening, Henry Royd. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of MASS. Um, tonight I'll be pre uh, presenting the MASS Virtual Gallery. Uh, this is an initiative we set up uh, to support photographers during our current crisis and the lockdown and everything that's happening. We wanted to have a uh, physical exhibition, um, but we basically created this gallery to be a sort of uh, an alternative to that. Um, during this uh, exhibition, we're also running a, a sort of fine art print sale. Um, that will be, um, it, you can find all the set, uh, prints that are for sale will have a little icon beneath them on the, uh, the shopping gallery and also through the print shop doors if you're in here. If not, you can find all our prints at uh, mass-collective.com. Uh, uh, um, tonight, I'll be presenting two of our great photographers. We have uh, Francesco Russo, who will be presenting Ruin or Rust. And we have Polly uh, Tutal, who'll be presenting her work uh, somewhere in England. Um, I'd like to say a quick thanks to everyone that's watching us tonight on the live stream. Um, a thanks to the Zoomed in audience for joining. Um, and also thank you to our co-founder, Luke Preferetti, uh, who'll be taking all of your questions that we can put forward to the photographers at the end of the evening. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm gonna let uh, Francesco take over and he's going to tell us a bit about his uh, project. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for, for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my, my work called The Ruin of Rust. And as you can see from the, from the photos, uh, um, it's a documentation of uh, the gas holders of London. And um, my interest for industrial architecture and uh, industrial heritage uh, started back in time when I was studying architecture. And I remember coming across this quote that I used to start the introduction of my, uh, of my, uh, of my project um, by uh, Antoine Bicon, who's a Harvard professor. Uh, and I'm going to read it because I, I don't know it by heart, but he says, um, why does rust frighten, frighten us so while the ruin is adorned with a reassuring character? The ruin restores man to nature. Rust, on the other hand, confines him to the middle of his productions, as within a prison, a prison all the more terrible since he's, the, he's its builder. So um, the title I gave to my project comes from this quote, uh, Ruin or Rust. And the whole purpose of this documentation is to put forward a question to, to the public, asking if uh, uh, these structures, these Victorian uh, structures, are ruin or rust. And when I say ruin, I mean um, the ruin in the romantic, romantic sense of the of the term. So um, the uh, a ruin uh, as it was. Uh, represented in the in the paintings of the 19th century um, and it's opposed to the, to the term of rust so something that deserves just to be demolished and replaced with something new when i started taking photos of um, of them more than two years ago i i started also getting into the the history of the gas holders and i found out that they are being demolished one by one and this is uh, because of the value of the land they occupy here in London. So originally there were um, about 40, 41, 41 of them in the greater London area, and now just 22 are, are still surviving. And um, the problem is that most of the times after they are demolished, uh, they are replaced with other developments that most of the times uh, don't have any uh connection or mm, yeah any dialogue with the with what was there before <clears throat> so um what i want to do uh, with my project is then showing what happens around them and to show what's the existing urban fabric and uh what's to show that there's life people live around them work around them and maybe show that there could be you know, the, the opportunity to use them to do something different, to uh, to do something creative, 
And something has already been done. One example is the RD gas holders in, in King's Cross uh, that have been redeveloped to new luxury flats. But I'm sure that architects have the, the creativity to, to think about something different to, uh, to do something something more more interesting and yeah I can see usually like open air theaters or you know, swimming pools or playgrounds I mean I think that's the opportunities are endless problem is that uh, most of the times they are not listed so they're not protected by uh, regulations and they are just demolished the, the series is still ongoing I hope to uh to complete it as soon as possible because i still have to cover about eight nine of them i hope to to manage and shoot them before they're all demolished so yeah uh, i think i could start um, talking about some of the photos in particular and i i would say uh, that this one uh, i'm gonna point it uh hopefully it's going to be yeah. visible. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. So this one is the one in Sydenham. And I'm starting with this because uh, this gas holder doesn't exist anymore. And um, uh, yeah, it's been demolished just a few months ago. Um, and the same thing happened with another one that is in the following room. So if you want to follow me, I'm probably going to be jumping back and forth a bit. Unfortunately. Yeah, I'll, bring your, I'll bring you the screen. Yeah, we can see. Thanks. Oh. Everyone can see to the uh, following one. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is. Um, I managed to get access to a um, recycling um, facility next to it, and um, yeah, I think this structure in particular is very beautiful. Was very beautiful actually because it doesn't exist anymore, because of his like very dense. Um, you know, net of uh, of of beams, and yeah, this is this is another one that I managed to photograph before the demolition. All the other ones that you see around are still existing, and in particular the one at the bottom of the gallery down there. That um, is another one that I am particularly fond of. Um, This photo um, is uh, from the gas holder of uh, uh, in Old Kent Road, and I I particularly like it because it tells, like, in a single image, like the concept that I was talking about before, and uh, it's a cage. It's definitely a cage that uh, uh, it's the prison that uh, the, the quote at the beginning was talking about uh, that uh, has the. Um, to two to blocks blocks of flats within it. So it's a sort of metaphor of what I was saying. So did we build a, a prison for ourselves like with these structures or is there a way to kind of free um, what's, uh, well, what's around them? So yeah, uh, I, could, I could probably tell stories about, about every single image, uh, but I think that if someone has questions or yeah. I mean, yeah. Thanks for sharing this entire. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for really listening. And, uh, yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll we'll have Holly take us through her work, and then at the end, um, if anyone the, uh, from the zoomed in chat um, or from uh, the room has any questions for Francesco, please think about those, and uh, yeah, and then we'll we'll ask them together at the end, and and go through a couple of questions for everyone. Thanks very All much. Right. Thank you. Let's do Polly. Okay. Hi, Polly. Let's take everyone through hey. to the other room. So I'll, I'll drag your screen with us. Everyone, could you follow us through? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Let's do it. Yes. Great. Let's see. Okay. Where is it best to stand? Yeah, if you just stand, um, sorry, I'll just make the screen a little bigger. By my uh, by the video. Oh yeah, let's do that. Why is it not getting much bigger? Hold on one second. Sorry. Let's do that. Let's try. Yeah, it's not allowing me to take. Oh, there we go. That's a bit better. There we go. Okay, cool. Bit of a bigger screen there. Um, yeah, if you just stand by your by your image, that's great. Okay. Thanks, Polly. Um, 
and then maybe face everyone. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. And then Matt, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm showing 10 images in the exhibition today. Um, and they are all a part of my series somewhere in England, which I started in 2010. It's ongoing. So it's yeah, no end point as yet. Um, I live in London and uh, I've always lived in the UK, which is probably quite important to look in relation to this work. Um, and I'm going to read something um, out to explain the project. Um, so forgive me for reading, but it's I can get my point across much better like this. Um, I photograph the built environment, looking for unidentifiable anonymous places. It's important to me these locations aren't recognisable, that they have no immediate meaning and they can't be placed. My images are about man-made space, spaces in general rather than a specific place. In fact, I never title my work, but rather catalogue number my images to keep them nameless and ambiguous. I started this work a long time ago, and, and during my degree, I was looking at the, the work of the new topographic photographers of America and Germany from the 1970s, drawing inspiration from photographers like the Beckers, who documented industrial facades with a meticulous process, with the intention of creating a vast list of these soon to be defunct buildings as a record of their existence. Or in contrast, Lewis Boltz, who photo whose photographs are a reflection of control and power influenced by and over human beings, capturing the man-made in a highly graphic artistic way. Images like this hadn't been seen before in the 70s, and when I discovered the work much later, I realised I was experiencing landscape and photography with a similar viewpoint. I felt compelled to travel the country to look for things to photograph. At this time, I didn't want to go abroad to make work. Everything seems exotic when you're out of your familiar place. For me, it was almost a test to try and find the bizarre in the banal. So I'd go on random journeys to anywhere I felt like, to the peripheries of cities or suburbia, liminal space, edge lands, looking for offices, housing estates, car parks, shopping centres, wastelands, explore, exploring the loop of a ring road or motorway with a viewpoint. I was searching for non-place or the anthropological spaces of transience. The places people pass through on their way to work or traveling home fascinates me. So I started documenting things I found with medium and large format cameras, slowly building up a list of images. And I'd say my work deals with a lot of parallels, thresholds and boundaries, urban and rural, leisure and industry, lived in and discarded, absence and presence, public and solitary, history and the future. For example, I'm looking at the way abandoned industry mixes with functioning architecture and development, depicting spaces left awaiting completion or areas of recent renewal. And whether they're suburban, urban or rural, these subjects I find are seen from the road. They're observed from the inside of my car while I'm exploring. I'm attempting to make images everyone can relate to, depicting places they've seen before in their own variations. It could be their street corner or underpass they know. I'm interested in how we relate to the spaces we travel through, we live in and experience, how our environment can affect our psychology, mood, emotions, memory, conscious or unconscious, how moving through the built environment can force you to encounter spaces you would rather not be in, motorway bridges, tower blocks, the oppressive concrete infrastructure of town planning gone wrong, or how our landscape has changed, perhaps for the worse, due to gentrification and modernization. The homogenous high street where the souls of cities are stolen by the big money investors who fill them with the sh same shops as you would find anywhere where the character of the place is lost new housing built out of town a constructed suburbia disconnected from the organic growth of society an important architectural critic from the 1950s ian nairn coined the word subtopia to indicate drab suburbs that look identical due to unimaginative civic design for, the special, for a special edition of the Architectural Review entitled Outrage, Nairn travelled across England observing and documenting the urban sprawl and ubiquitous municipal architecture. Outrage proposes an order of every facet of suburban aesthetics, covering subjects ranging from wire fencing, telegraph poles and streetlights to military installations and power stations, culminating in a manifesto and checklist of planning malpractices. I was exploring the same sub subject matter in a similarly disparaging way. I was also interested in forming a list of these places to build up a picture index of Britain. 
But wanting to create more than just a document of these places, I attempt to subvert, subvert them, elevating the mundane, transfer, transcending their meaning or heightening the atmosphere. I use different, different techniques to achieve this, like shooting at night with a long exposure, letting too much artificial light in for a cinematic aesthetic, or taking shots early in morning light for a subtle painterly color palette. Looking, and so looking to other influences like the American road movie or an Edward Hopper painting. I'm trying to evoke the feeling I have when I'm standing alone at 4 a.m. in these landscapes. In a few of my photographs, you'll notice tiny, notice tiny figures in the distance, but those, mostly my images don't have people in them. It's important, though, that a suggestion of human activity is present as it heightens the potential drama and it alludes to the suggestion of a story, a, a surprise encounter, fiction, capturing a moment before or something or after something is about to happen. Finding these scenes can be really difficult. Long drives, often uneventful or uninspiring. Occasionally you get lucky and find something amazing easily. Deciding on what to photograph is instinctual. I won't make pictures, I won't make too many pictures of the same thing. And when a place or building is presented to me, I can decide fairly quickly how to shoot it. Um, so now I just wanted to sort of walk around and have a look at individual, some of the individual images to explain a bit more. So I Yeah, that's good. I'll uh, I'll pull around the screen and you sort of point at the image that you want to speak about. And yeah, uh, yeah we So I don't just do a laser beam to that one. So yeah. if everyone can see in a uh, gathered around the first image, which is of the housing development oh, yeah. here. There's a loads of greenery. So I'm always looking for a scene that could hint to a social or cultural critique and to make images that could contain a metaphor for a more complex meaning. So for this image, um, it's a modern housing estate built inside a quarry with its manicured front gardens and rows of similar cars. It appears to be completely cut off from anywhere else due to being in this cavity. The viewer looks down monitoring it as if we are Big Brother controlling its future. So to me, this highlights the sterilized living conditions of consumerist contemporary society trapped in a suburban hell. Um, and then the, the image next to it is of a, a brick wall, brick wall image. Oh, um, so it's a similar thing when I'm looking for like a metaphor within each image that I shoot. Obviously, su successful images are normally that. So this one is, um, it divides Leighton it was, as it was left on one side and the newly developed Olymp Olympic village on the other side. It's always bricked up, suggesting you can't enter, you're excluded from the gentrification and money on the other side. Um, and then I have another one to its left, which is with a security camera. Um, And this one was shot 6 a.m. It was really early morning light as the sun came up. Um, and that's why it's got quite a painterly quality. I don't do any retouching really, it's just color tweaking on my images. Um, and this sort of struck me, I guess, a similar thing to the sterilized housing development. Um, the security cameras appear looming down. Um, asking the question, are we all being watched? So, and I guess another social, you know, social, cultural critique in that image. And then um, looking at this warehouse, this brown image of, of the warehouse is, is, a, is a photograph of the, like the last, I think it's one of the last, um, industrial warehouse buildings on Liverpool's docks. Um, and that is going to be turned into a hotel. So the beauty of the industrial ruin will become a homogenous sterile site for out of town visitors. So again, it's like similar to looking at things similar to Francesco's work, with these, you know, beautiful relics and what is going to happen to them as time goes on. That's that's one of my main interests too. Um, and then going into the last room, there's two more images. Okay, let's all follow, follow through. Coming. There we go. I've got 
verstanden. Um, so I'm looking at the if everyone, I'll wait for everyone to come. That's right. Um, everyone in? Everyone we're just next door. There we go. That's great. Okay, so I'm looking at the water tower and the phone box. So that yeah, the, these two perhaps relate to Francesco's work. The water tower has become obsolete, like the gas containers in his images. The foam box, I predict, will eventually become a relic too. And a photograph within their lands within their landscape show the quiet suburban context. Um and then I'm not really going to talk about any of the other images, but maybe they could be questions for people at the end. And just in, a, in to summarize, I would say that I hope my images reflect the spirit of my country with it, its ido idiosyncrasies, and that they're not too cynical or downtrodden. I'm not trying to give answers to the questions I bring up. I just hope that through making images people can relate to, I, gain, I, gain, I can engage them for long enough so that they too ask themselves these questions that they consider their environment and the lessons we can learn from the spaces we make and inhabit. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Polly. Thanks for sharing that with us. And it's a really lovely project to see and some very, very interesting images. I hope uh, everyone who watched uh, enjoyed that and enjoyed seeing Francesca's work as well. I know we had a, a little bit of a, um, of, a, of a technical issue on the live stream. Sorry, I'm just going to pull up my video. Um, uh, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in. Um, I'd like to thank the LFA as well for giving us the opportunity um, to talk about our work today and to show some really great artists like Francesco and Polly. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'd also, you know, implore the, the crowd to think of some questions if they have any. I, I've actually got a couple myself that I'd like to ask. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just see if, if anyone does. Would anyone like uh, the room like to ask a question to Francesco or Polly? Okay, well, I'll ask probably yes. Uh, yes go Eric. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just go like uh, um, because I think you come forward a little more, Francesco. Right? Okay. We can hear you better. Sorry, just come forward a little more. Thank you very much. That's perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. No problem. Yeah, I'm literally learning how to move around. Um, <laughs> That's fine. Not a problem. <laughs> no, I was just thinking like, uh, I mean, thanks for to both of you uh, guys. It was really really interesting. I was just keen to understand i think like in your practice how important is the research behind your actual project because i think both of you like it's not the actual commission that you go down one day and you just photograph a building it seems like both of you like has to spend times to research and understand what you really want to photograph so i would just like try to think like um, um how long Let's say it's not really like taken from you to do the research, but how important it was for you to plan uh, the shooting um, in preparation to prepare your project? I'd say. Uh, Bonnie, would you like to start? Yeah, for, for me, absolutely no planning. Um, oh, well, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I would normally just feel like. Think where where do I want to go today, or um, look at a map, um, thinking about you know in post-industrial cities, peripheries of cities, like I said. Um, so yeah, no no real research, just a feeling, and then getting in my car and going and driving. That's it. It's very spontaneous. <laughs> Oh, um, planned and not thought out. So. And yeah. how about uh, Francesco? What's the? What do you think for, for yourself? How the? Oh, Francesco, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> We'd love to hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I, oh, I muted me before just to make sure I wasn't bothering the conversation. Yeah, no. Uh, someone would say probably no wonder, but yeah, for me it's uh, completely the opposite. I there's a lot of planning behind my. Um, uh, my projects and the first, the first bit. Um, well, sorry, sorry. There's some uh, audio issue. Um, 
Yeah, I think someone in the audience is. It's fine. Don't worry. Yeah, about it. It's not sorry. Your own. Good. Yeah, no, I was just wanted to make sure this was going fine. Uh, so now I was saying that there's a lot of planning. So as you see, there's a map at the beginning. So I had to do the mapping of the gas holders, which uh, uh, was not super super easy and. Um, also, I had to find out which one were demolished and which one not, because someone would say, yeah, Google Map can Google Maps can do the job, but not always because like they are demolished so quickly that like it's happened to me once that I went to photograph one of them that was there on Street View. And I got there and found out that it was the last day of the demolition. So they started demolishing it a week before. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't really easy. And also to take photos of of the structures uh it's important to find the right angle so uh for most of them I went there at least twice first time to do a bit of scouting find the right angle and then back again to to go to do the photos with the right light so there's a lot of fun cool Fair thanks enough. guys i hope that answers the question um, yeah, and I suppose then I'd like to ask a question to Francesca about his project. Um, and that was all about sort of, uh, do you know why they're knocking down the gas holders? Is there a particular reason for that? And um, do you think that they still value these structures? As I know that the question of your topic is all about uh, ruin or rust. And, and do you think there's still a value for those gas holders now? Or are they just being totally demolished? And replaced by new buildings, or as uh, similar with Polly's, there's sort of these erection of these uh, of these new buildings. So um, is that is that what's happening to them, or do you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, even if my my uh, let's say my abstract, let's call it this way, is a question asking if uh, if they're uh, if they have a value or not, I obviously have a, have a thinking, and I, and I do think they have value. Um, they they are demolished just because probably it's the easy way to go to to recover the land they occupy and build something different, something new. The problem is that most of the times the new thing is not something that has any connection to the to the past of the of the place, to the history, to the industrial heritage. So that's why I think that we should try and you know. Uh, pay more attention to these uh, to these things when, like, I'm talking to architects at this time, uh, when uh, and developers especially, uh, we should give more importance, I think, to, to to the industrial heritage when it's time to propose new developments. Mm. Definitely. It was it because yeah, like you say, with the motivation. Is, is there something very? Have you done any very short-term projects to sort of? You know, versus the long term, and found in differences in the way that those sort of work or the inspiration mm -hmm. or the approach mm -hmm. of being a method. I have, but those the small the 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 shorter projects have been things abroad and probably more linked to um, jobs or editorial commissions. Okay. So this is my kind of main one, and and the one that every, people come back to as well. Mm -hmm. Probably my strongest work, and that I can't really understand why that is. It's a strange yeah. thing. I feel like, and, and also people have asked, "Oh, well, put it in a book now. Come on," and I, I'm not, not sure yet. So Fair yeah, I, you're not you sure. sure you, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to keep plugging <laughs> away and things. And also, you make sense of things more as you kind of step away and come back. Yeah. So yeah. Fair enough. And I suppose because with Francesca, you, you've been shooting this project for two years as well. And as, yeah, more than uh, two years, yeah. Exactly. And as you've seen it sort of develop, um, do you find that it changes the way you select the images or the way, I don't know. Is yeah, there, very much. Because when you started out, where maybe you were like ecstatic about just starting the project and very excited. And, and it, it, was there a lot of thought process but like before you, because I think from what you said you had this more methodical approach to it so how can you explain a bit more about that with your math and stuff as well with the beginning, which is quite nice well yeah the, the that's one of the reasons why i had to go more than once to shoot uh, some of them is also because i while i was shooting i developed the style and the technique to give consistency mm. to the project so the ones that i shoot at the very beginning were 
just the start of the research. And then when while I was working, I started understanding how I wanted uh, the aesthetic uh, of the of the project to look like. So uh, I would say that after six months, a bit more, maybe almost a year, I I had a better idea of what I was doing. So I had to go back, reshoot some stuff. So yeah, it's, no, it's uh, it took a while, but yeah. yeah. And and Bibo, how with the sort of final selection, how 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 did you go about doing that for your projects? Is it was that a difficult process? Uh, and Polly, was it has it just sort of because you say is it is over time? It, is that something that was easier over time? They, like the images that were that were part and and you felt were right to show in the work, they they sort of came about because of the time you had to sit back and enjoy them or. Or yeah, I mean, yeah well it's kind of it's the so most of the the 10 images here around 2014 i think they're all ones 2010 yeah. um editing them for me is really easy in the snap of my fingers i know and i don't really photograph like loads of the same thing mm -hmm. kind of it's like in a similar way as i find the places photograph them and edit down really easily okay. it's like it's weirdly the, the thing that comes naturally okay. doing this project finding the locations is hard because it's driving you know i don't really do any research i don't know if it's if i'm wherever i'm going i don't know if it's going to be successful or not um it's more of a random like plugging away driving around looking and then when I come across something I know what it I know it's going to work and then with the probably not thousands but only hundreds of images that I can edit them quite quickly knowing what works and what doesn't um, and yeah. obviously some some are like some you want them to work and they don't because it's there's nothing there or you know aesthetically it might be nice but it's not that depth you know there are reasons so you you know but mainly it's just okay yes this is it's an easy thing for me to edit. yeah okay. and ag again for me it was quite the opposite <laughs> because yeah. um i think that having circular structures doesn't really help because you don't really have one main facade or angle as normal mm. buildings like normal buildings have a main facade usually the gas holders don't so for everyone i had like endless points of view that's where you know potentially good so for everyone i had to and most of the times most the, the, like the the, the the fact is that these most of the times they're huge structures so i had to go quite far out to uh, to take photos and to show them as the backdrop of the scenes I wanted to show. And this basically results in a massive area to cover because if you take, I don't know, a kilometer of, of ray from the gas holder and you walk around it, <laughs> it's a huge area. So, yeah. you know, uh, I had to, to cover a lot, to take a lot of photos. So for me, editing down has been very difficult. Like for every gas holder, I have at least a couple, let's say two or three shots that I really mm -hmm. like. And so, yeah. you know, making a selection is, is ne never easy <laughs> for me yeah. at least. No, that's fair enough. Well, thank you, um, both of you for, for talking about your work and answering questions. And if anyone else has any last minute questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, uh, we'll say thanks to everyone for joining us the stream. And uh, the talkers will still be here. I believe that uh, Luca will be sharing the links in the live stream as well. So if you want to come in and join us and speak to any of the photographers one on one, they'll be here and I'll be here as well. And thank you so much, everyone. Cheers, man. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah,